This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to 2400 documentaries and nonfiction titles free for one month by following the link in the description. In 1940, Redmond, Washington was a sleepy agricultural town with a population of 503 people. It was located on the northern end of Lake Sammamish in the Puget Sound region. Redmond was only 15 miles from downtown Seattle, Washington, which by the 1940s was a thriving city. But Redmond was separated from Seattle by the long, narrow Lake Washington that formed an imposing barrier. It was in 1940 that the first floating bridge across Lake Washington was built, and Redmond began to slowly grow as a bedroom community to Seattle. In 1963, the Evergreen Point floating bridge opened, and the trickle of new residents became a flood. Tens of thousands of new residents moved in. And it wasn't just residents either. Redmond became a critical regional job center. Microsoft, Nintendo of America, Aerojet, Rocketdyne, and a host of other tech companies moved to Redmond. What was once a sleepy town of 500 was now a suburban powerhouse. But with nearly all of its growth coming in the auto age, Redmond lacked one important thing, a main street or downtown. Redmond does have a small historic district, but no quintessential main street or shopping district befitting a city of its importance. Redmond Town Center, built in 1997, stepped in to fill that void. It's a mixed-use development featuring shopping, restaurants, hotels, and entertainment. Redmond basically built itself a new main street from scratch. They weren't alone. In the last few decades, about 500 lifestyle centers, the retail industry term for Redmond Town Center type developments, were built in suburbs and cities across the United States and abroad. They sort of look like main streets, but are they the real deal? Are they actual urban places or just knockoffs? Traditional main streets and lifestyle centers are connected by a long history of retail spaces, and all retail spaces are influenced by Main Street. The idea of Main Street, filled with small shops along a bustling street, is so ingrained in American culture it's a toponym for small towns and small businesses, the opposite of Wall Street. Traditional Main Streets feature two- and three-story buildings along a straight, busy street. Retail is located on the bottom floor, with apartments and offices located above. The street itself accommodated all modes, but worked particularly well for those on foot. In the streetcar era, large department stores anchored the busiest intersections along main streets. Once cars began to take over the roadway, main streets began to suffer. First, there wasn't enough space on the street to store all those vehicles. Parking lots ruined their greatest strength, continuous facades of shopping for pedestrians. And cars eventually took people away from downtown and into the suburbs. Suburban retail streets altered the form of main streets. First, the strip mall moved the buildings off of the street. Parking lots along the street accommodated cars, and their location made it easy and convenient for drivers. Nobody wanted to walk along these streets now, however. In the 1950s, retail space changed again. Stores were once again facing each other, but now completely enclosed in a climate-controlled pedestrian space. Department stores moved to the end, encouraging shoppers to circulate past all of the smaller shops. Parking surrounded the stores, forming an asphalt moat. It was, of course, the modern shopping mall. The mall has become synonymous with the suburbs. It was the gathering place. By the 1980s and 1990s, it was so much a part of American culture that teens hanging out in the mall was a veritable movie trope. The mall became more a part of daily life than Main Street, or what was left of it at this point. Malls outcompeted downtown shopping, and many Main Streets were a shell of their former selves. Not only did malls provide a comfortable, climate-controlled space, complete with a food court, but they also ushered in the rise of the national chain stores, which could sell clothes, electronics, and pretzels, all at discounted prices and you could always be guaranteed ample free parking. In the 1990s and 2000s, malls and the stores in them faced increasing competition from online retailers like Amazon and eBay. All of a sudden, malls were the less convenient option, ironic considering that's how it outcompeted Main Street in the decades before. Mall developers also overbuilt malls. There were just too many at a time when people were shopping online more. Malls began to die, though new malls, those in really strategic locations, and those with high-end stores survived. Mall developers realized that if they wanted to keep building malls, and of course, why wouldn't they, they needed to figure out a way to respond to the convenience of the internet. Their research suggested that shoppers now wanted experiences, not just convenience. Shoppers wanted dining options better than Sparrow and an Instagrammable setting. They wanted something authentic-ish. Enter the Lifestyle Center. It's a return to the roots of retail with outdoor shopping. They typically include restaurants, movie theaters, along with the stores. And they may also include a mixed-use development that include housing and office space. Their names, like Downtown Silver Spring, City Place, Twin Creeks Village, and yes, Redmond Town Center, all evoke urban places. So are lifestyle centers real urban places? Are they more like main streets or more like shopping malls? Let's look at some key attributes and see how they stack up. Let's start with the shops. 
On one end of the spectrum, main streets are typically home to mom and pop shops and locally owned businesses. On the other, malls are home to chain stores that can be found nationwide. Lifestyle centers certainly fall on the mall end of the spectrum, as they are primarily developed by mall developers and filled with mall stores. Let's talk about the design of lifestyle centers. You can go from shop to shop outside. It seems like it's easy to classify it as a main street, but it's not that simple. Main streets consist of small and medium-sized buildings, built in different times and often consist of different styles. Lifestyle centers give the impression of different buildings, but they are only different facade treatments. The buildings themselves are large and really no different than a strip mall. We'll put the lifestyle center somewhere between the mall and Main Street. Context is critical too. Are lifestyle centers connected to other uses or are they surrounded by seas of parking? Can you get to them via mass transit or bike? Main streets are typically well integrated into the surrounding neighborhoods, as they were historically reliant on foot traffic for sales. Malls, on the other hand, are usually surrounded by moats of parking, punctuated by fast food restaurants. Lifestyle centers will sometimes include other uses into the development. They can include offices, housing, and entertainment uses. They are still heavily auto-oriented and feature parking lots and garages. They also don't connect to the neighboring uses nearly as well as main streets. There is some significant variation in how good lifestyle centers are in terms of context, but most are nowhere near main streets. Finally, let's talk about public space. The street itself on main street is public. You have a right to congregate there, to protest there, or to simply be there. That is not strictly true in shopping malls, which are private property. In the United States, the balance between the rights of shoppers and the rights of property owners can vary by state. California, for example, requires mall owners to allow leafleting and protest on its private property, while other states are less accommodating. Malls may be sort of a de facto public square for suburbanites, but they don't have the same rights as those on traditional main streets. Lifestyle centers, just like malls, are private property, even when a street runs through them. This street right here is private. In fact, I feel a little bit uncomfortable filming here because I feel like I could get kicked out because this is private property. So where does that leave us? Lifestyle centers are designed such that shoppers have to go outdoors between shops. Lifestyle centers may also be part of a larger, mixed-use development that could offer densities greater than the surrounding suburban area. They may indeed be the most urban part of a suburb, particularly those like Redmond Town Center that don't have a long history of downtown development. But they are a far cry from a true main street. True main streets can't be built all at once, surrounded by parking. They must grow organically in walkable areas. So Redmond Town Center may offer shoppers something different than a shopping mall, but it still shares most of its DNA with one. If you've made it this far in the video, you probably like videos about cities. Did you know that you can check out dozens of documentaries and series about cities over at CuriosityStream? When I joined, the first thing I did was search for videos about city planning, and I was excited to find a lot of videos on topics from cities of the future to ancient cities. I did a study abroad in Rome way back when, so I immediately gravitated toward this documentary all about the cool things under Rome, including aqueducts and sewers. I was sucked in pretty much immediately. And if for some reason you have interests outside of cities, CuriosityStream has you covered. There are over 2,400 other titles on the service, including content featuring Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. A CuriosityStream membership is ridiculously cheap, starting at just $2.99 a month. And if you go to CuriosityStream slash City Beautiful, you get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. If you enter the promo code City Beautiful when prompted during the sign-up process, your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. So go check it out.